Do you think you found the skeleton? How would you tell people about the skeleton? You first, first, first. How would you tell the Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure it's not that. Hey there, you two, the Dapper Dinosaur here. As you may or may not know, I have been quite sick for quite a while, although I am on the mend. But, because my voice is terrible and I don't want to keep doing this right now, I have asked my friend Dead Kennedy in Space to help me out on this video. If you have not yet subscribed to him, please go do so. The link is in the description. And enjoy this video. Hello everyone, my name's Kevin, also known as Deg Kennedy in Space, and I'd like to thank Dapper Dino for giving me this opportunity to do a little takeover of his channel here. Of course, I'm just speaking his words because he's a little too ill to do so, however, I will do my best to keep you all entertained. The video that we're taking clips from today is from a series of lectures that, according to Mr. Hovind, were accepted by a few colleges for credit, which is just horrifying. Each one of those cells contains a little nucleus in the center, and the vast majority have 46 chromosomes. A few have 23, the gametes do. Well, so far so good, but I wonder if he knows why gametes have half the normal number of chromosomes. Probably not. If you took all the DNA out of one person, it would fill about two tablespoons. Teaspoons are the small ones, tablespoons are the big ones. It would fill two tablespoons with just pure DNA. If you took one chromosome from every individual on the planet, and this chromosome, each chromosome contains the blueprint, the instructions for how to build the entire person. Nope. Each chromosome is in a pair, and each chromosome pair has unique genes. You need every single one of those chromosomes, or at least one of each type, to build a human. One chromosome just won't cut it. So if you had one chromosome from each person on the planet, theoretically you could make every person again. You have the information to make a new Becky, or a new Steve, or a new Eric, or whoever, okay, from one chromosome. All of that information, 5 billion or 6 billion chromosomes, would be about the size of an aspirin. That's the information capable of making every human being again on the planet. That's with our current understanding. We may discover later that even this is mostly space and it could be condensed even smaller than that. Just unbelievably complicated. Well, at least you're being consistent, even with this flurf level of scientific knowledge. Now, if you unwound each one of those chromosomes, number 46 in each cell, each one is about 6 or 7 feet long. So you get 6 or 7 feet times 46 times 50 trillion. One person's chromosomes would stretch from Earth to the moon and back. Round trips, 5 million round trips to the moon. And keep in mind, that is like a twisted ladder. Now, to make it even more interesting, if we had our ladder from here to Chicago, and we twisted it and twisted it and twisted it, and as you, like you do a rubber band, you get it tighter and tighter, and pretty soon it starts to double knot. You know, it's, it starts to loop again. Okay, similar idea. We're going to take this long ladder from here to Chicago and split it all the way down the middle. Each one of the rungs of the ladder is going to be cut in half. All the way from here to Chicago while it's twisted. It is going to unwind from the other half, so we have two half ladders. Either he's describing duplicating a chromosome or transcription, unless of course he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's going to join up with the other half ladder from your husband or wife, wind itself back together from here to Chicago, and make a child. Each half of the rung is a genetic trait. Wow, not even a little bit. That wouldn't even work. Each one of those rungs can't just join up with any other rung. They come in pairs. If you have one side of the DNA, there's only one possible way for the other half to completely bond to it. What actually happens is the reason that those gamete cells only have half the chromosome count of a normal cell is that when a sperm and egg come together, they carry together the whole chromosome count. Chromosomes don't split apart and mix together because they can't. Instead, you get half your chromosomes from your mom and half from your dad. After they are in the new zygote, they may mix a little, but not along the length of the ladder. Instead, they'll swap whole sections. 
maybe the dad supplies the half of the rung for blonde hair and the wife supplies the half of the rung for brown hair. Well, which one's the baby going to have? Well, that gets into which one of these genes is more dominant. There are dominant and recessive genes. The baby might end up with blonde hair, but capable of producing a brown-haired child. Because even though what expressed itself in that generation was blonde hair, they are carrying the gene, the half rung of the ladder, for brown hair. So then the grandkids come out with brown hair, or depending on who they marry. And that's a very interesting study. You get into that in biology class, studying all the, you know, what can happen when you cross different genes together. Nope. Brown hair is dominant, not blonde hair. I think Kent's not going to say a single thing right this time. But the genetic structure is incredibly complicated. They say that the code in the chromosomes is more complex and holds more information than all the computer programs ever written in the history of humanity combined. First, genes don't come in half ladders. They are sections of the whole ladder grouped into base pairs, which is one of those rungs. The base pairs are grouped into codons, which is a group of three base pairs. Each of the 64 codons has a specific meaning. These codons are grouped into genes, each of which codes for some protein. Second, the human genome has about 2.9 billion base pairs, and since each base pair requires only two bits of information, the whole genome can be written in 725 megabytes. That's like a single patch for a video game. Not even a whole video game. Even if for some reason we decided to take every base pair and assign it to a whole byte, it would still be 2.9 gigabytes. Most modern hard drives have several hundred gigabytes of storage. Now, suppose I told you to take your computer program, we're going to load uh, Windows uh, Millennium Edition, or Windows 98, or Windows 95, okay? Any one of those programs. I want you to take that program with all that list of instructions and copy it onto a disk. Now I want you to take that copy and copy that onto another disk. Then take that disk and copy it onto another disk. The more times you copy it, the more likely you are to have mistakes come in, problems come in. You ever seen a photocopy of a piece of paper where somebody copied an article and somebody else said, wow, this is good, I'm going to make a copy of this. So they copy the copy. Then this person says, wow, that's really good, I'm going to copy that. So they copy the copy of the copy. After about eight or ten copies, you can't hardly read it. You ever gotten something like that? You just say, wow, it's all blurred, you know, everything starts to run together. I like how we've gone from copying files on a disk to photocopies. Photocopying intentionally reduces the information in the original to make it easier to make real-time reproductions. Copying files in a computer and making copies of DNA are not intentionally limited in this way. Photocopying is an intentionally bad analogy. We are a copy off of a copy off of a copy off 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 a copy of Adam. Do you realize how many times this gene code has been duplicated? It's been duplicated a lot more than you think, and so what? There is no evidence that each generation in any population has lower fitness just because it's the next generation. In fact, actual laboratory experiments show the populations tend to increase in fitness. And why is that? Well, in part, it's because DNA copying is far more reliable than your photocopy analogy would lead people to believe. To say DNA is small and therefore it must be simple is absolutely ridiculous, okay? It is unbelievably complicated. Does anyone actually say that about DNA? That because it's small, it must be simple? I think that's just a straw man. If you typed out the code, now here's what happens. A DNA has four base pairs. What they've done is they've taken each of these genes and they get a whole cluster of molecules and call it a base pair, like they give it a letter A. That was so bad it wasn't even wrong. I can't even parse what you just said there. It made zero sense. So they will say, well, DNA is very simple. There are only four base pairs. Well, hold it. That's like me saying, you know, vehicles on the highway are very simple. There's only four basic kinds. You know, there's trucks, there's cars, there's motorcycles, and there's buses except that each truck, car, and bus is different from every other one, but each guanine or thymine molecule is the same chemically as every other one. Well, just because I can put them into four simple categories doesn't mean each one is simple. Each one of those categories is very complex. You know, how many, how many things are there on a car? Well, for example, thymine has 15 atoms in it. That's not terribly complex. It's more complex than, say, a water molecule, but it's far simpler than a bus. If you typed out the genetic code, found in the chromosomes of one person, 
When you got done typing, you'd have enough books to fill Grand Canyon 40 times. No, you wouldn't. In fact, here's a picture of someone with a hard copy of the human genome. It's about the size of a large multi-volume encyclopedia. Maybe if you decided to make a copy of that for every cell in a person's body, then it'd take up the Grand Canyon, but then it would be full of a lot of identical books. I think that's enough for today. Not only does Kent Hovind not know what a dinosaur is, he doesn't know what a gene is, what a base pair is, what a chromosome is, how sex works, or how chemistry works. There's nothing wrong with not knowing that stuff. Unless, of course, you're trying to pass yourself off as some kind of expert and teaching a course that's supposed to be for college credit. Again, I'd like to thank Dapper Dino for giving me the opportunity to appear on his channel and uh, for giving me the opportunity to rip Kent Hovind a new one. That's, that's always fun. And, uh, you know, Kent may not know how sex works, but he, he had a kid once, right? Maybe that was by accident. Anyway, thanks for, uh, thanks for listening to me, everyone. Take care, and have a great 2020. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to take a minute to thank my patrons, especially my $20 patrons. Ben Tovind, Ian Chen, Bob Knob, The Evil Scotsman, Henry Hutanen, Chris Love, and Res Instance. My team over at Patreon are helping me make these videos, and I have tiers starting as low as a dollar and going all the way up to $100. So if you'd like to help out the Dapper Dino channel and help make these videos better and possibly even more frequent, then why don't you head over there and check it out? If a recurring donation isn't right for you, but you'd still like to help out, I have a link to my Amazon wish list in the description. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. <laughs> How would you tell how would you tell the dinosaurs? You first person. How would you tell the dinosaurs? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.